The Bible says there was a canopy of water above the atmosphere. Wait, now the canopy of water is above the atmosphere? Well, that sort of pulls your theory out of the intellectual cesspit, and that Noah and crew are no longer living in a meter of liquefied atmosphere, 100,255 atmospheres of pressure. The atmosphere's normal thickness is gas-based, and the pressure is a healthy 1 atmosphere or 100 kilopascals. Oh, but it's still completely dark because the canopy is still blocking out all light from the sun. However, now the canopy is above the Earth and is orbiting the planet, and this raises problems of its own. Since the water is still liquid, it will undergo some frictional heating. The water at the base of the canopy, being at a lower orbit, will have a greater tangential velocity than the water at the top of the canopy. Therefore, more work is being done on the water at a lower orbit than the water at a higher orbit. This energy difference will be dissipated as friction or heat. So how much will be produced? Well, the formula would be FL delta XL minus FH delta XH equals delta E, where FL and FH are the centripetal forces acting on the canopy at its base and top respectively, and delta XL and delta XH are the displacements of the water at the top and base of a unit column of the canopy respectively. Now since your diagram shows the canopy of water being very close to the atmosphere, I'm assuming it's just above it. So we have the centripetal force at the base of the canopy, FL, through Newton's law of gravitation, equaling 4.08 times 10 to the 13 newtons, and the centripetal force at the top of the canopy, taken from where the canopy is just about one water drop thick, FH, equal about 6.306 times 10 to the minus 3 newtons. Now let's evaluate the displacements of the unit column based on top per unit time, one second. Velocity is measured in meters per second, and so if we work out the orbital velocities of the top and base of the column, we will also have their displacements in meters within one second. The orbital velocity of a body can be approximated by the square root of the universal gravitational constant, times the sum of the two masses involved, all divided by the square root of the orbital radius. Using this, we have delta XL equal about 2.02 times 10 to the 9 meters, and delta XH at about 84.19 meters. So now we can plug these values into the expression for thermal energy generated, and look what we get. 8.24 times 10 to the 22 joules of thermal energy produced per second. That is enough to raise the temperature of the unit column of water by about 1.92 times 10 to the 13 Kelvin. And I'm not even going to bother converting that into degrees Celsius, because that figure would be more or less the same. Minimum temperatures required to achieve nuclear fusion typically lie between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 9 Kelvin. If the canopy was miraculously poofed into existence around the Earth during creation week like you claim, it would have instantaneously transformed into a star the Earth would be completely melted by the immense amount of now solar radiation. Yeah, much more effective ways to wipe out life on Earth than a bit of water, would you agree? And water under the crust of the Earth. Water under the crust of the Earth? Well, I mean, the estimated amount of groundwater under the Earth's surface is about 0.65% of the total water on Earth, which is still an immense amount. But I get the feeling that's not what you mean. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's. <clears throat> he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. I hope you know what that really means, right? See, when God first made the world, the crust of the earth was stretched over. Most of the water that's now on top was underneath the crust of the earth. There were vast subterranean water chambers. There are still huge amounts of water, huge water chambers down in the earth. Just because there are big water chambers underground does not mean that there was once an utterly massive subterranean water chamber extending under the whole earth, which, like the canopy, has no evidence of having ever existed. The Japanese drilled down, I forget how far, just recently in early 2003, and they said there's probably more water deep in the crust of the earth than there is on the surface of the earth. There is no source for this claim, but I'm assuming that you're misquoting him slightly, and that what he meant was there is more groundwater on Earth than there is water in lakes and rivers. Because the alternative that there being more groundwater on Earth than all surface water is just fucking stupid. The Earth has cracks all over it. it seems like a baseball. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the uh, San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault, the Golden Fault, the Ring of Fire... Whoa, be careful Mr. Hovind. Sorry, but I refuse to call you Doctor. Only one of those faults is a mid-oceanic ridge, which is where I think you're going with this. The others are faults, which are caused by tectonic margins scraping beside one another, 
not moving apart as in mid oceanic ridges. The Ring of Fire is a line of volcanoes following a subduction zone that runs around most of the Pacific. It is the complete opposite of a mid oceanic ridge, since here plates are coming together and not moving apart. There's no question the Earth is all busted up into plates and the Earth has been gone through some really hard times. It's busted up like an eggshell. I love it when creationists say, there's no question that, as if they're trying to strike common ground with their opponents. It's usually the setup to sound outrageous straw man or is in itself a half truth at best. This statement is okay, but I dread what's coming. I think that happened at the time of the flood, not millions of years ago. There we go. There is ample evidence for magnetic reversal patterns that the seafloor has been spreading for millions of years, and is continuing to spread today. That happened implies the seafloor once started spreading, then it stopped, which is simply not true. You can see it spreading today. And God said the water gushed out of the earth when it broke up. I think the plates of the earth broke apart. The fault lines are still there today from what happened during that flood. So the San Andreas Fault, which is clearly moving sideways, was where the flood water for the Great Flood was ejaculated out of the earth, even though it's completely obvious the fault is transverse, not diverging. Dumbass. And the earth is broken up into plates, and the plates are still moving a little bit, which causes earthquakes, volcanoes, you know, I've studied all that stuff, taught science for years. So it's not convection currents in the mantle driving the plates, but is in fact then slowing down from when they were, presumably, moving much faster during Noah's flood. Even though there is a massive amount of evidence for the former, but no evidence at all for the latter. Yeah, sure you taught high school earth science for 15 years. People say, wait a minute, isn't that proof of Pangaea? No, that's not proof of Pangaea. Textbooks say all the continents fit together. Well, that's baloney. Oh my god, are you blind or some shit? They don't tell the kids, you know, the truth about this. This textbook says South America and Africa seem to be a perfect fit. That's a pure coincidence, folks, based, folks, based on the water level. We don't determine plate boundaries based on coastlines, you ignoramus. We measure them based on the continental shelf margins, and what do you know, they fit even better that way. Is it also a pure coincidence that these continents share the same stratigraphy and paleontology, and that a divergent plate boundary lies perfectly in between them, and all the immense amounts of evidence in support of the former existence of Pangaea too? Here's the evidence they give to support continental drift. They'll say the shapes of the continent seem to fit. Similar fossils are found on opposite sides of the ocean. Textbook says, see this? Same fossils found in Africa and South America. Well, so what? Those same fossils are actually found all over the world. And doesn't that bolster the case for Pangaea? It implies so in the bloody picture on your slide, and yet you do not comment. Is it just me or do all you guys think Hovind is full of shit? This is just as much proof of a worldwide flood. No, please. A worldwide flood would just deposit all fossil types uniformly around the world, and we do not find that. Instead, we find them in distinctive bands, which display migratory patterns of the animals between the then conjoined continents. No, wait, I guess that's another pure coincidence. How far could the dead animals float in a year? Mm -hmm. Even if these fossils really indicated the paths of diluvian ocean currents, which there is again no evidence for, these currents are just bizarre. Do you see this? This is just as impossible as it appears to be. So they point out the two found on opposite sides of the ocean, but they don't point out the same ones are found everywhere. They don't point that out because they're trying to, you know, push off a theory on the kids. Any good science teacher will tell their students to think critically about things, not brainwash them. Unless you think that brainwashing is how education works, which wouldn't surprise me. They don't tell the kids, they shrank Africa nearly 40% to make them fit. If you cut it out on a get, a, get a globe and cut Africa out, and then cut South America out, and compare it to what they did in their textbook, they shrank Africa between 35 and 40%. Well, let's test that, shall we? Here I have an open source image manipulation program. Load up a map of the Earth, highlight Africa, using the coastline just to be consistent with your straw man, and reduce the size by 40%. Oh yeah. They won't even notice. All of Mexico and Central America are gone in the Pangaea maps. Señor, ¿qué pasa? ¿Dónde está Mexico, Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala? Hmm? It must be that Hovind is being willingly ignorant about the utterly plausible, naturalistic explanation for this, even though it's beyond the scope of most high school science courses. Maybe that's just as far as Mr. Hovind's scientific education extends. 
the big continental plates that we are all familiar with, the North American plates, the Eurasian plates, the Indo-Australian plates, etc., are not the only plates. There are many other smaller microplates, which for the purpose of simplicity are not normally shown. The Mariana microplates, the South Sandwich microplates, the VG microplates, etc. These two can collide with larger plates, and with each other in the same way that India is colliding with Asia, and that the Pacific plate is being subducted under the North American plate. These microplates, and indeed larger oceanic plates, tend to be subducted due to them being made of denser oceanic crust. However, if they carry an island or a small landmass, that is not subducted, since it is less dense. It is therefore appended to the continental crust, and the continent grows as a result. This is how land masses such as Central America and Alaska were built up, by the accretion of islands and small continental land masses through the subduction of oceanic plates and microplates. Granted, this concept is too advanced to teach the most high school science students, but Mr. Hoban's claim that Pangaea didn't exist because Central America prohibits the continents from joining together is just willingly ignorant. They don't tell the kids that Europe and South America rotated one way and Africa was rotated a different way. Well, this is perfectly possible too. Remember your high school science lessons, Mr. Hoven? At divergent plate boundaries, plates move apart. But guess what? The spreading rate isn't uniform. And what happens when the spreading rates aren't uniform? That's right, the constant on one side of the ridge rotates. Well done, Mr. Hoven, for recognising this. Oh, wait, you didn't. They also don't tell the kids what I think ought to be obvious to a kindergartner. Did you know if you take the water out of the oceans, you will notice there is dirt underneath? What? There is. I mean, the oceans actually have a bottom. Yeah, no sh**, Mr. Hoven. What's your f***ing point? People say, do you think the continents were connected? I say, what do you mean, were? They still are. It's just the low places are full of water, that's all. <laughs> it's, not like it's, it's not like these are hollow, you know, it's hollow under here and they're floating around like lily pads in a bathtub, you know. Oh, that's what you mean. You dunce. I thought you taught high school science for 15 years. What did I learn in high school science? Well, I don't know about you, but I learned that oceanic crust is denser than continental crust. So when continents come together, it sinks. And you know what? It's also produced at near the oceanic ridges, and this drives the continents apart. Therefore, the continents are riding on the oceanic crust like they're on a conveyor belt taught high school science for 15 years, you probably would have failed the very high school science exams your supposed students sat. The Earth has a solid crust, okay? I think the Pangaea theory is one of the dumbest theories in the world, but... What little respect I had for you was just... Oh, wait, actually I lost that little bit of respect when you agreed that bugs are not alive, so I guess nothing's really been lost.